Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to day 16 of the Organometallics grad course. We'll start with a few administrative announcements. First is that the peer review for your Wikipedia article is due June 1st. So please keep that in mind as we head into the weekend here. Uh, next week, you'll get a break from hearing from me. We'll have two guest lectures, the first on Tuesday from Sharon uh, Neufeld at Montana State University, and the second on Thursday from Nick Ball at Pomona. They will both build on themes that we covered today in terms of palladium catalysis, cross-coupling, uh, but obviously much more in depth on specific aspects that are relevant to the research programs of those two investigators. So uh, those are both lectures to look forward to. The way that we'll be running those is that we'll keep this room open if you um, prefer to attend. So they'll, they'll both be remote and this room will be open and running. So you can just pop in if you prefer it that way, or you can just join by Zoom from the comfort of your home or office as you as you prefer, whatever works best for you. Uh, we'll take attendance on the days where we're, we have a virtual option uh, just manually. So if you don't sign in, then, then we'll keep an eye out for you in the Zoom room. Are there any other announcements from the TAs? No? I don't think so, okay. We had a few minutes of notes to wrap up on allylic substitution, and then we'll charge right into cross-coupling. There's a lot of ground to cover. I'll do my best to cover as much as I can. Well, providing sufficient detail to have a nice discussion. And I'll try to, in, in my notes here, I've tried to, um, my screen share is paused. Let me get something up here. There we go. The way I have this organized, I, I think going into this, you know, a, a fair number of you will be at least somewhat familiar with cross coupling reactions and the basic elementary step. So, I'll try to sprinkle in a fair amount of history and then modern examples. So even if you know cross-coupling inside and out, hopefully there's still something new for you to take home from, from today's lecture. Okay, but before jumping into cross-coupling, let's wrap up our discussion of allylic substitution. We ended up, bless you, we ended up class with a discussion of this problem where uh, there was an observed easy isomerization event in the catalytic allylic substitution. And getting into the mechanistic details here, we proposed that this would take place via an eta 3, eta 1, eta 3 isomerization or haptotropic shift process, also referred to in the literature as a pi sigma pi uh, rearrangement. So, this is also important not just in terms of alkene stereochemistry of the resultant products, but also in terms of the absolute stereochemistry of the resulting products in cases where uh, there's the opportunity for absolute stereo control, either with the chiral ligand or coming in with a uh, chiral scalemic starting material. So let's, let's consider um, the details of, of that point that I just made. Uh, we already mentioned how in the terminal case where, where we have terminal allylic alcohol derivatives or family members thereof, uh, initial formation of an eta-3 pi owl takes place, but then this can exist in equilibrium with the eta-1 form. And then if you're thinking this through, you'll recognize that this can, the metal can then reassociate to the opposite face and what you've done essentially, if you look at the intermediate on the left here and the intermediate on the right, these are mirror images of each other. So this provides a mechanism by which a, a terminal pi owl can undergo um, racemization over time. And you can take advantage of that in processes like uh, 
die cat reactions, dynamic kinetic asymmetric transformations. Um, and, and there are examples of that covered in the Hartwick textbook that we won't go into just in the interest of time. But you can imagine then that the relative rates of this isomerization and then subsequent trapping with nucleophiles will affect the overall stereochemical outcomes of the processes. The terminal case is quite, is, is quite relevant to what we just covered in terms of the EZ uh, problem and, and problem of the day number three. Internal case is arguably more interesting because here, when you make this haptotropic shift from A to three to A to one, you don't ablate the stereochemical information. Now you transfer essentially from um, the, the, a, a, chir a, a chiral, if you're going in with an anti-rich star material, you transfer into in an anti-enriched intermediate, A to one intermediate, and stereochemistry is preserved during this uh, haptotropic shift, uh, provided if the, the L intermediate is asymmetrically substituted or, or non-symmetrically substituted. So, Nevertheless, there are still processes by which these intermediates can undergo racemization. So how might that take place? Does anyone want to hazard a guess? Well, in this case, let's say we're, we can consider palladium since we've considered palladium as uh, throughout many examples so far. If you have another molecule in solution, you could have a bimetallic process by which one metal engages an already formed metal pi owl and essentially inverts the stereochemistry. And when might, this be, when might this be problematic? You could imagine this would be problematic in cases where you have a lot of free palladium zero sitting around in, in, um, in solution or a lot of, and or a lot of the, the pi owl accumulating in solution. So in cases where trapping of the pi owl is, uh, um, uh, is, is, is slow, then that gives the opportunity for a metal a second metal to, to come in through this bi metallic process. So often in the context of preparative chemistry, this would be disadvantageous. So it's important to understand how you might inhibit this mechanism of, of racemization. So how might, um, if we had to throw out some ideas here, how, what, what, what will we think? Probably one of the our Okay, that wasn't one of the three that I thought, but that's that's fine. So why would a directing group help you here? The directing group is going to try to this uh, binding this alkene to the metal, envision a, uh, another molecule of the metal attacking this alkene. Okay, so there'll be a greater energetic penalty because you'll lose the chelation upon the substitution. Okay. If the nucleophilic attack is slow, you can increase the concentration of nucleophile to kinetic behavior trap. Okay. Assuming that doesn't affect the other catalytic process. Okay. Lower the catalyst loading. Lower the catalyst loading. I like that. Trapping rate. Any other thoughts here? You bulk up the ligands on palladium. Okay, I like this idea of tuning the ligand coordination sphere. And empirically, it's been found that Biden, use of bidentate ligands 
is effective. Why is that? When you have a bidentate ligand, typically, let's think these are TP or TN type ligands. They're often LL ligands. So when you coordinate the pi L, now you're going to have a cationic form of the pi L, which is more electrophilic and trapped more effectively by the nucleophile. Uh, thus suppresses the rate of this bimetallic process. This palladium palladium isomerization mechanism has been studied in quite a bit of depth by um, several researchers, including notably Jan Beckwall, a former mentor of my own uh, at Stockholm University. So I direct you to this 1992 paper for more details if you're interested. We talked briefly about an antioselective variant, and uh, there are many different ligand designs. We talked about the Trost ligand. We talked about the uh, uh, Fox type ligand design, and many groups have uh, built on this, developed their own ligand scaffolds, iterated on these established scaffolds. Um, the question I will pose to you here is: Let's say you wanted to develop a analog of the Fox type ligand, knowing that this is a well established scaffold and work substitution for particularly for an antis like variance. Um, but you wanted to develop a version that would proceed with faster rate building on the discussion that we had just um, we just uh, uh, outlined. Uh, thinking that that might not only improve rate but also potentially improve EE by virtue of out competing isomerization process. So let's just, there, again, there's not necessarily a right or wrong answer here. So let's get some ideas down uh, for how you would further tune Fox if you wanted to increase reaction rate. And for the purpose of this discussion, let's assume that the trapping step is what is rate determining. What do you think there, Jim Tao? So, uh, probably tuning the phosphine side with a stronger trans effect. Okay, a stronger trans effect. Um, what do you have in mind there? Because the uh, uh, one trapping with uh, a tra a trapping moiety, um, a stronger trans effect helps to uh, leave that, uh, that part. Okay, okay. I think you're, there's, there's potentially two competing factors, although they could compete in the same direction potentially, which is you want something that is going to uh, increase the overall electrophilicity of your pi L species, but also exhibit a trans, stronger trans influence to destabilize the carbon metal bond trans to it, right? So, Let's just focus on that first design principle. If you wanted to make something that's more, gives a more electrophilic pi L, what, what might you do? Let's go ahead and, for example, replace this phosphine with a more pi accepting phosphite. And then if one wished, one could even, sorry, this is not a phosphite. One could even introduce chiral information along this new backbone in the form of vinyl or other chiral diol derivatives. There are some other changes here. This is a somewhat subtle example because you'll appreciate that you're also um, changing the, the bite angle and the overall chelate size. But you know, first approximation, you make something a stronger pi acceptor and you're confident that trapping is the determined limiting step and that would accelerate your reaction rate. Um, and that also could, because of the, the points you mentioned above, benefit you in terms of the EE. What other, just to get some other ideas on uh, uh, out here in the in, in discussion, what, how else could you achieve a similar effect? Slap a nitro on the area. Okay. Although sometimes in ligand design, people don't like nitro groups because they can introduce other processes. Uh, 
they can, for example, get reduced by low valent palladium and, and, and to the anilines, but let's say a CF3, para CF3, 3,5 CF3, good ideas. Anything else? Other thoughts? Can change the sterics of the R group. Change the sterics of the R group to make it bigger or smaller? So I think you were saying that the trapping of the algae is more important. So maybe make it smaller. Make it smaller. Okay. You can also, of course, substitute FOC, and people have, have done this with substituents here. So we've talked about edits here, edits here. You could also, if you're adventurous, edit oxygen to some, some nitrogen with an electron withdrawing group. Even more like many different tricks you could you could play here around this architecture. Uh, this brings us to the chemist of the day from last time, who is has been involved in uh, in some some important uh, studies in this area of research. I'll make sure I get the spelling of her name correctly. Uh, Montserrat. Dieguez, who was the lead author on, I think, what is now the most comprehensive up-to-date ChemRev on asymmetric allylic uh, substitution reaction shown here. Uh, earlier, there's a nice historical perspective that talks about the evolution of the trophy and specifically um, that I would direct you to there. Um, and <clears throat> Professor Dieguez, Dieguez is a uh, faculty member at the University uh, University of uh, Rovira and uh, Virgil, which the Spanish spelling is uh, Rovira. in Tarragona, formerly a postdoc of, uh, of Bob Crabtree. Okay, good. Um, so please, uh, if you're interested in more details about an anti-selective versions of these reactions, consult the, the handout and the corresponding chapter of the Harvard textbook. Okay, let's wrap up this discussion then by turning to problem of the day number four from last time. I'll pull that up here. In case you don't have your worksheet from last time. So this is a open uh, question where creativity is very much uh, needed and desired. So we've talked about this concept of soft nucleophiles where at least in the carbon nucleophile space, the unifying principle is these are relatively acidic conjugate acids with pKa's below 25. But then one might wonder, and folks have wondered, Let's say you wanted to engage a broader range of carbon nucleophiles with higher pKa's. Could you devise strategies by which you could engage those desirable coupling partners? And I've shown three here that are <coughs> have been of interest. Um, how might one do that? Just using here, you don't need any fancy tricks. Just just applying concepts that you probably learned in, in undergraduate orgo classes, what are strategies that you could potentially, and, and then maybe some more advanced ones that you learned in this class, but what are strategies that you could, could use to engage these types of couple of parts? So take 30 seconds to think about it, and then I'll ask for volunteers. So maybe as you're thinking, let's orient ourselves in terms of the PKAs involved here. So anyone want to chime in here? Ludidine, does anybody, or oh, this is picoline. Picoline, anybody know the PK? Ballpark? 10. 
Well, the question is for, for PK greater than 25. But you're right, if you, if you add 10 to 35, 25, then you'll get in the ballpark. So that's PK 35. And then you know that the other two are going to be more acidic than, or you know, this one will be more acidic than, uh, than picoline. So this is another 10 PK units. Thirty-four for picoline, forty-four for toluene, and here there's some range depending on the aromatic substitution constituents. Just north of the typical range for soft multiplier. Okay, so you've had a chance to think about it. So, what do we think here? Give us some strategies. First, let's consider the picoline case. What do we think, Don? Do we have to keep the, the same structure to put like electrons and drawing groups elsewhere? Okay. To... For the purpose of the question, let's say you have to keep the same structure. So maybe let me reframe the question. If you wanted to acidify the methyl group of picoline, how might you how might you do it? I can't put anything else in the ring. I don't know if I could maybe replace one of the H's with the halogen and then do like a lithium halogen exchange. I don't okay. know if that really solves the problem. That's it. Interesting. Interesting thought. So do a, okay, so do a, like a radical halogenation and then lithium halogen exchange to get to the nucleophile that, that you would need. You might still run into problems because that nucleophile is now quite aggressively basic. You could throw off the tall stuff. Any other thoughts here? Lewis uh, acid or alkylate nitrogen. Aha, okay. Lewis acid. What what Lewis acid would you prefer here? Something basophilic, so maybe copper acid. Okay, those are good ideas. And I think the one that was actually developed in practice was, was BF3 or BF3 etherates in the Trost group. Okay, what about toluene? Any thoughts here? Now you've got even less to hold on to. When do you look contemplative? What do you think? This may be a little out of the range, but can you use something else to coordinate to the benzene? Ah, love it. Okay, so your general. I, I, I love the way your train of thought is going. You, what do you need to do to acidify something? You need to pull electron density out of that pi system. Here, you only have aromatic um, uh, pi orbitals, but we've, we've learned in class that you can coordinate. Beautiful, okay, we'll get even more specific. Chromium tricarbonyl, be able to coordinate to arene pi systems. And indeed, that can lower the PKA. The CH bond, allowing it to be deprotonated with relatively weak base and then engage as a soft nucleophile. And then the last one, well, you could probably apply that same trick we just, just mentioned. It might give you a mixture of mono and di, and that might be helpful. But any other thoughts here? This one is not so much a, a, a sort of conceptually distinct strategy, but just recognizing that here you're already near the PKA cutoff of what we know can engage a soft nuclear cloud. So what if we were to just do a base screen and then what would be the design principles of the base that you would you would want for, for, you, for this sort of thing? You probably want something quite basic and quite starkly bulky so that it itself is not engaging as a nucleophile in the oblique substitution. And so you might, Think about some metal, hexamethyl disilazide, HMDS. That's what the group of Patrick Walsh developed uh, to do this exact transformation. Let me, I don't have this reference here, so let me look this up in case. Um, 
read more about it. And this is a nice reference because um, in it, uh, the Walsh Group provides also a discussion of these, these previous precedents that I, that I mentioned and provides those references. So you can use this as the starting point if you want to read more about those strategies. Beautiful. Any questions on the whole substitution before we move forward? All right, cross coupling. Right here. Okay, so there's a, a lot of content to cover here, but the guiding concepts I think are quite simple. And so I'll try to spend a few minutes discussing these guiding concepts and then you'll see these principles manifest again and again and again through multiple examples. The key catalytic cycle is the one shown here. I think one of our former TAs said something to the effect of, you'll see this so many times in today's lecture that you'll go to sleep dreaming about it. And then during your dreams, come up with all sorts of ideas for your own cross couplings. I don't know if that, maybe Camille and Nathan can ask to attest to whether that happened or not in with the year that they took the course. The key order of events um, to, to, if you're encountering a, a cross coupling, you should go into it with the following mechanistic framework, that it's going to proceed through a, a series of events of oxidative addition to the organic electrophile, transmetallation, the organic metallic nucleophile, and then productive elimination, CC or C heteroatom, depending on the nucleophile that's employed. Now there, and, and this is almost always what is happening with palladium. There are exceptions to this, particularly when you switch to other metals, You'll see examples with nickel, whereas the transmetallation step will happen first to make a more electron rich nickel species that can then oxidatively add. It's the same steps, they're just happening in different orders. So, oxidative addition, transmetallation, reductive elimination, essentially all cross couplings share these features, at least within the redox neutral paradigm. What do I mean by the redox neutral paradigm? This is the classical polarity cross coupling, nucleophile plus electrophile, catalyst and then no exogenous oxygen or reductant. There are variants on this, for example, where you couple two organometallic nucleophiles or an organometallic nucleophile with a heteratom nucleophile. So think here, Chan-Lam coupling, where you have an organoboron plus a free amine, and then you need a terminal oxidant to close the catalytic cycle. Just makes sense even from simple undergraduate chemistry, if you have a nucleophile attacking another nucleophile, then the two electrons from that coupling have to go somewhere. And so then there needs to be an um, oxidation event. And then very much in vogue during the past 10 or 15 years, um, the, the history here goes back a ways, but um, this, the, the, the recent wave of interest was very much ignited by the work of, of, of Dan Weichs and others in this generation, reductive cross coupling where you have two organohalide coupling partners, often they need to be differentiated. For example, one alkyl, one aryl, and then you're partnering that with a terminal reductant. In the context of nickel, that's often metallic zinc, metallic manganese, it can also be organic reductants. Those transformations are appealing preparatively, and I think these are actively being looked at uh, on process scale in pharma because they avoid the need to, to uh, prepare and then use organometallic nucleophiles. If you ask yourself, where, do, where does like an aryl boron come from? And then you backtrack that, more often than not, it's coming from the corresponding aryl iodide via a process called Miura borylation, which we won't cover today, just in the interest of time. So if you could use that aryl iodide directly, that would be advantageous. And that, that is the uh, motivating motivation behind research in reductive cross coupling. There's also a related category of reactions that this is not textbook stuff. This is just my own framing for, uh, for, for how you can think about this universe of reactivity. There's so-called conjunctive cross couplings. And this includes reactions that my group has worked on 
where you're taking the classical reaction partners from across coupling, but there's some third reaction component. It could be CO, it could be SO2, it could be alkene, you know, kind. And that cross coupling reaction is taking place across that so called conjunctive coupling partner. So a multi component cross coupling or conjunctive cross coupling. Why is that nomenclature, from my perspective, helpful? Because it allows you to orient yourself mechanistically. You see aryl boron, you see aryl iodide, and you see CO, and you think, okay, these are normal coupling partners for a cross coupling. Let's try to think from that perspective in terms of catalytic cycle. So you're going to have oxidative addition, and then the, the difference will just be a migratory insertion into the, into the CO followed by transmetallation replication. The history looking back here is interesting because most of the initial work was done with nickel. And then uh, nickel ran out of steam to some extent and was largely passed, surpassed by, by palladium. Why did, was palladium attractive despite costing much more? It's because it's much more predictable. It does predictable to electron chemistry. Many of the intermediates are isolable and can be studied. You can walk palladium couplings through every step of the catalytic cycle. And there are very robust ligands to support extreme turnovers, turnover numbers with palladium. But now you, we will, of course, all appreciate in this department that there's a renewed interest going back at least 15, maybe 20 years in nickel, iron, copper couplings, first row metal couplings, because these avoid dealing with the high price of palladium. Of course, we all know the Nobel Prize was awarded in 2010 for palladium catalyzed couplings. There have been many, many reviews. Um, I think a good one to start with, and we've taken the timeline from, from this um, review from the late uh, Victor Sneekis, um, written in, in collaboration with Dick Colicott and, uh, and, and uh, Karen, who was a guest speaker here as part of the Sinocompound Lectureship. Uh, this provides a nice historical perspective into the developments that led to this. this so I direct you there as a, as a starting point if you want to orient yourself in this field. Okay, let's dig into where this reactivity paradigm came from. So this will be like an intellectual warm up, and then we'll get into some more uh, interesting examples. So this is the, the stoichiometric warm ups here. So let's just. Um, Look through, uh, let's refresh our memory on some of the elementary steps. And one way to think about this is that prior to integrating all of this information into a catalytic cycle, the individual modules, the catalytic components, the elementary steps were, were known out there in the literature. So let's consider an early example from Chat and Shaw. What is happening here? We're going to treat this nickel tube as phosphine starting material with two equivalents of Grignard. What are we going to get out? Madison. Transmetallation, okay. And the byproduct is what then? Magnesium, X, bromide, and the driving force for the thermodynamic driving force for this transmetallation thinking. And if you'll allow me to scroll up, this goes to a key point of cross couplings that I didn't highlight above, which is often the turnover limiting step is this transmetallation. And the nomenclature that is used when we talk about name reactions, normally the name reactions are associated with a different transmetallating partner, Kumada, Nikishi, Stili, Suzuki, et cetera because the transmetallation step is often turnover limiting and thus is tuning this reagent to um, facilitate transmetallation at an appropriate rate is, is thus the name of the game in this area of study. Okay, so we've got the transmetallation there. And you might ask, why doesn't this undergo further processes? At least in the case of the MES, this is is, is quite bulky, so it's deactivated from, 
undergoing isomerization and downstream processes. Okay, let's consider now a, a diorganonickel where the two organic fragments are locked in a cis orientation by virtue of the NN bidentate ligand. What might happen in this step? So we're just going to dissolve this diethyl nickel in chlorobenzene at room temperature. What would you expect to happen here? Elin? Okay. So okay. I, I thought we will have the reactive elimination first to get the Okay. Okay. Beautiful. I like the way you explain that. So initially you thought let's oxidatively add directly, but then you heard what I said. It's just room temperature. Uh, getting to nickel four. There are nickel four species, but normally they require some special supporting ligand. So that doesn't seem that appealing to form that. So here, we're just going to have a reductive elimination. That's going to get us to nickel zero. We're going to lose butane. Which we're going to boil off as a gas. And then this is going to react further with the aryl chloride. Chloride. Get the oxidative addition add up. Beautiful. So there we have it. Those are essentially all of the building blocks that we need for cross coupling. We've got oxidative addition, we've got reductive elimination, we've got transmetallation. Let's just put them together. And indeed, in the early 70s, these were put together nicely. Um, in the form of the, what we now call the Kumada Koryu coupling or the Tamao Kumada Koryu coupling. Here's the original reference from the lab of Kumada. The lead author, who I believe was assistant professor at the time, is another famous chemist that we will you'll know from other coursework here, Tamao. And so, particularly in the Japanese uh, chemical community, uh, Often, uh, they often associate uh, Tamao with as, as part of this name, name reaction. Um, the specific example is a, is a coupling of a Grignard with a vinyl, uh, vinyl chloride to make the substituted styrene product shown here. Already low catalyst loading, you see the use of a bisphosphine ligand. And these reactions are, these Kumata couplings are used even to this day. What is the advantages and disadvantages? What are the advantages and disadvantages of Kumata coupling? The advantages are they're often very fast, and very robust. They can be used to make extremely hindered bonds when they work. The disadvantages stem from the fact that you're using a Grignard or in some cases an organic lithium and intrinsically then you're going to have limited functional group Compatibility. Sometimes the catalytic cycle runs so fast, you can tolerate more functional groups than you might expect. But often, if one of your fundamental inputs is a Grignard, you know, that is, a, is going to be a challenge for functional group compatibility. Uh, here's an example from the modern literature to illustrate that point that I mean that you can make very hindered bonds, low catalyst loading, quite efficiently. So a theme that you'll see running through these examples now that I'll present is, is that with each iteration from, from Kumada to Nagishi to Stille to Suzuki to Hiyama, we're backing off the transmetallating rate, backing off the reactivity of this transmetallating partner in order to improve functional group compatibility. So that's the, that's the theme that we, uh, we actually need to take this in an opposite direction, in a sense, to make things less reactive so that they're more user-friendly. OK, let's take a look now at problem of the day number one. And we've considered um, early work with nickel. Now we'll turn attention to palladium and answer a question that has arisen 
a few times um, in class already, which is how do you get how do you get on cycle? So let's look at this example here that I went through quickly more closely. You'll see that the starting material uh, in this Kumata Koryu coupling is a nickel two precursor, but we said that more often than not, these are running by nickel zero two cycles or nickel one three cycles or palladium zero two cycles. So how do we get to the active form of the catalyst? That's the question we're going to answer here. And I think many of these we've encountered in some form already in class, so we can go through this quickly. Let's do number one together, uh, since this is maybe the most, most straightforward. Uh, what do you think, Pernali? Palladium dichloride plus two equivalents of an aryl rhenium. How do we get down to the active palladium zero form here? So, so I guess I'm not really sure because if palladium does any kind of like transmetallation within it, like you wouldn't get to zero. So I'm not sure. Okay, so let's. I, I think your your thinking is exactly in the right direction here. So you said transmetallation, so we're going to swap out one chloride for an aryl group. Then we're going to swap out the second chloride for an aryl group. We're going to generate as byproducts here magnesium salts. That's our thermodynamic driving force. And then what's going to happen next? You've got a diaryl palladium. Beautiful. Elimination, palladium zero, plus the corresponding biphenyl adduct. Now we're on cycle and we're ready to go. Okay, let's consider the next case. And for this one, I guess we'll pick anybody but Shenghua since he's been working on uh, related, related uh, work here. Um, what do you think? Uh, who I have, haven't I called on in a, in a while? What do you think, Annabelle? You got palladium to bisphosphine dichloride and plus sodium acetate. And we need to get down to palladium zero. Okay, yeah, you can do that. So you want to make the corresponding diacetate. That's fine. Then what's going to happen next? Let's draw this out in a little bit more detail, and it might be easier for you to see. Okay, what's, what do we think might happen now? Alex, what do you think? You wanna, uh, you wanna so and we're reducing palladium, so. Aha, uh -huh. okay. So I think if this is, not familiar with you, then you can always start this first principle. Just ask, okay, what is we need to we need to reduce palladium to what's the strongest reductant in solution? And you'd look and you'd say, okay, it's probably the phosphate. So the electrons at some point way are going to have to come from the phosphate. But in this case, they'll get an assist from the corresponding acetate. And this can be inner sphere or outer sphere. I've drawn the inner sphere route here. And now what do you what are we going to get out? We're going to get palladium zero. And we're going to get a phosphonium adduct. Then 
that then can be hydrolyzed to the phosphine oxide, providing the thermodynamic driving force for this reduction. So in these cases, you'll recognize that you're consuming some of the phosphine ligand during the activation. So this is often the reason why if you use a palladium two precatalyst and a phosphine ligand, you'll see the phosphine used in two equivalents or in excess. So that with the expectation that some of it's gonna be lost for in situ reduction. Okay, and then the last one we covered already last time in the heck case. So we'll just jot that out very quickly. We have the palladium two precursor. It can coordinate an amine that can trigger beta hydride elimination. Corresponding aluminium. And then the palladium hydride with base. Let's make the palladium zero adduct. Good. Any questions on that? These are not the only way you can activate your catalyst from the plus two oxidation state to the zero oxidation state, but these are probably the three most, most common pathways. And again, it goes back to this theme that when you're reading a paper, it's important not just to, to think about what is the oxidation state of the precatalyst, but what is the overall context? What is most likely to be the active oxidation state of the catalyst? Yes. I've heard it said that for the second mode of activation, yeah. you always need a little bit of water. Is that true, or can you just have that phosphorium kind of hanging around it? Uh, I think this is a topic that is still actively being investigated. Um, I think that depends on numerous factors. I'll give you the, a, a quite extreme case. There's a recent organometallics paper uh, from uh, TJ uh, Colacott, where they can actually, um, with one particular trialkyl phosphine ligand, they can even have chloride. They can make the chlorophosphonium adduct that does not need to be hydrolyzed. They can re-isolate even the chlorophosphonium confirm that they're making it, and that's enough thermodynamic driving force. You don't need to get all the way down to the phosphine oxide. I think often you do, because often you do have water around, but that's not strictly necessary. Yeah. Okay, uh, moving forward, Nagishi coupling. So now we're, I said decreasing our transmetallating power, but getting functional group tolerance going from organo uh, magnesium to organo zinc. And another um, factor that motivated interest in palladium is, is the synthetic context in which reactions of this type were being applied back in the 70s. And that was in the synthesis of conjugated polyenes. It turns out, for reasons that inherently aren't obvious, but I think are, if you think about it, you can rationalize why this is. It turns out that alkenol nickel species uh, are more readily isomerized. They undergo easy isomerization uh, more quickly than the corresponding alkenol palladium atoms. So given that people were applying these predominantly uh, predominantly to make polyenes, that's not a good feature if you're isomerizing. So people shift attention to palladium. So there's a really intimate connection between synthetic target selection and this shift to uh, palladium in the, in the early 70s. So how do these isomerizations happen? That's worth just commenting a little bit more on. So if we consider the corresponding alkenyl metal species that's formed after oxidative addition, let's say in the case of nickel, and then these can undergo easy isomerization. The mechanism is a little bit murky, or at least my view on it is that it's a little bit murky. And 
what's often invoked is a so-called eta-2 alkenyl metal intermediate. What does that mean? Well, one way to, to, to draw it is just that that pi system, you have a, a sigma bonding interaction and a bonding interaction from the pi system. It's called eta-2 alkenyl metal intermediate. And how to visualize that, I'll, I'll leave that to you to, to think about. If you don't like that explanation, you can also push electrons in a different way. You could push electrons off of the metal to, to make a, a carbonoid intermediate, and then that would essentially weaken that SP, CSP2, CSP2 bond so that you could rotate around it. But in any case, this isomerization process is important to understand in the context of alkenal couplings. and why folks were interested in shifting to palladium. So palladium does not suffer from this uh, as, uh, as dramatically as does nickel. Um, so attention was focused on palladium. Nagishi was the, the obviously did important work uh, in the early days to, to showcase this um, uh, the utility of, of palladium in polyene synthesis uh, using less electropositive uh, metal-based organometallic coupling partners. So let's consider this first example from his, his group, again, geared toward polyene synthesis, coupling this alkenol aluminum reagent. And how do we make this? Thinking back to our main group lecture. Alkai and uh, diamo. Okay. Corresponding, thank you, Shanghua, alkyne plus diamol. And he finds that coupling with the corresponding iodoalkene with palladium chemistry uh, proceeds in relatively good yield and high stereo specificity. But again, here's the problem. You have only slightly backed off your transmetallating partner in the aggressiveness of your nucleophile. So you have very little functional group tolerance, not making it a good choice for natural product synthesis. Here's a key observation uh, as described later in a retrospective from in this accounts of chemical research. Now in the context of an aryl alkenal coupling, he ran this experiment where uh, this aluminum coupling does not proceed at all, even after one week. I always look at this result and think, I've got to give the student credit for still checking you know, you check six days, no reaction. You check day seven, still no reaction. Uh, maybe, maybe Nagishi was the one who was encouraging him to, to continue checking. It's like six day induction period, probably day seven, nothing's gonna happen. But anyway, there's no reaction after one week, but look, we add zinc chloride here. And now we have a very high yielding, efficient and stereo selective reaction. So what's, what's happening here? Of course, this is no, no surprise, I think, based on everything else we've covered so far, that we have an in-situ transmetallation from aluminum to zinc. And this would probably make the zinc. I'll just draw this as X. Group diorganism. Organism halide. This is the active coupling partner, and now we're hot to trot in what we now think of as Nagishi coupling. Here's a now just a canonical form of the Nagishi, um, an alkyl alkenal coupling. Not too much to say about this. It should be pretty straightforward. But you see, the point I want to make here is you see the evolution of this serendipitous result into now a full-fledged, powerful CC bond form method. The utility of Nagishi couplings goes hand in hand, of course, with how to make the corresponding organozinc halide coupling partners or diorganozincs. And now generally, if you had to compare organozinc halide and diorganozinc, you would say that organo the diorganozincs are more reactive 
and I think this makes sense if you think about the, the electronegativities of the ligands on zinc involved when you have a halide that's more electron withdrawing and that's weakening the delta minus or, or low, uh, uh, contracting the, the homo lobe on the, on the carbogenic fragment. Whereas when you have two carbogenic fragments, they, they're, 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 um, they're both uh, uh, highly uh, electronegative and have, have high homo coefficients. Yes. Uh, when we use dye alkynes, yeah. how many of the alkynes are taking part? That's a good question. I think it depends on the context. So when you need that extra boost in reactivity, then the first and not the second will transfer. If it's if the reaction is accepting of of both diorganozinc and organozinc halide, then, then both will transfer. You'll get two equivalents per couple. It's context dependent. Okay, so how do we make these? Let's just think back to our main group lecture. So give me some syntheses of the corresponding organozinc halides. We just saw one, so I'll draw, draw this one. Uh, organometallic, so this could be a Grignard, it could be organolithium. Um, could be, in the case above, uh, organoaluminum. <laughs> Okay, give me another synthesis here. Beautiful. So, and the corresponding coupling partner will be the organohalide. Then, thank you. Was that Christine? Thanks, Christine. So now zinc metal or zinc copper couple. If you're using, if you, if you have done this chemistry yourself, you'll know that um, X, Y, you know, this is generic. X, you'll know that you typically need activated zinc here because this initiation is uh, overall reaction is heterogeneous. Initiation is sensitive to the quality of the surface, zinc surface. And what about diorganosinx? Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Okay, so one thing you can do is just do the exact reaction I just showed, but in this case, you need to drive it a little bit further. And you can do that if it's a Grignard via the Schlenk, Schlenk equilibrium. So you want to crash out the corresponding magnesium salts, for example, with dioxane, with brown ethers, with, with ether can also work for this purpose. And there's a really nice example from the group of Charette here in this Jack's paper showing a very preparatively useful uh, method here. The zinc dihalide is not always the optimal solution in this case. In the Charette paper, they use zinc methoxide, actually. Good. What, what else? Another common one is to come from the corresponding organoboron. So you take an or diorgano zinc that you already have a decent amount of, and the, the canonical one is diethyl zinc. That's what I think everybody has in their lab. And then the, the R group that you want on the organozinc, you bring in boron and you'll get transmetallation. And then again, you'll drive this equilibrium because your product in this case, diethyl boron, which is volatile, you can just solution. Uh, please note that the stoichiometry here is not balanced, but uh, just an interesting. 
in the shorthand. And then the other uh, version is sort of a hybrid of these two approaches. Oops. We just transmetallate from hybrid of hybrid of um, Christine's approach and the approach I just mentioned. So now we go into the organic halide plus diethylene, and out is going to pop the corresponding diorganosine. And salt. Good. Any questions on that? Uh, this these methods are all reviewed in this nice um, organic reactions chapter from uh, Paul Rochelle's group. Okay, moving forward now, we'll take a look at organotin coupling partners in the so-called Stille or Magita Stille coupling. Inspiration here came from an important and sometimes overlooked example from Eborn in the mid 70s. Eborn does this reaction where he, so the Eborn group does this reaction where they are reacting bromobenzene with this dystanane reagent here, interesting. And out pops biphenyl. So what's happening? here. And why do I say this is a precursor to the Megita Stille coupling? What do we think, Oscar? How do you get biphenyl from this? We're coming in with palladium zero and we've got bromobenzene. So a good starting point is probably just to go ahead and do that oxidative addition. And palladium two, what was a halide bromide? Okay, now what? Transmetallation, okay, beautiful. We're going to transmetallate. And if you're familiar with Miura borylation, this is going to start to look pretty similar. So we've transmetallated. Now we have tin as a ligand. We lost, what did we lose during transmetallation? We lost the bromo, bromide salt. And then now what? Uh, is that the elimination? Beautiful, reductive elimination. Now we've got our standing, one aryl group, three butyl groups. The aryl is going to be preferentially transmetallated. And now it's we're set up for our Stilly coupling. So it's a, it's a stilly in disguise. It's a stilly where we generate our nucleophile in situ. So that was an early important precedent. In 1977, then Megita reported an example with acyl chlorides as the electrophiles. And um, Organostanes is nucleophile catalytic palladium. Um, I think this chemistry, it was, was at the time and maybe in the years since, that it was more debatable because it's an acyl chloride specifically, what's happening mechanistically and whether that connects directly to the rest of the cross coupling canon. Um, but in any case, this initial manifestation was with the acyl chloride and then. Um, As you can read here, Stille's contributions of shifting to aryl electrophiles and developing 
milder conditions and also performing in-depth mechanistic studies is what launched the modern Stille. So this initial work from Stille focused on owl, tin, uh, nucleophiles. And now, of course, we know that you can couple efficiently a range of different organotin nucleophiles. And the key point compared to the Nagishi work that I showed, and especially the Kumada Koryu work that I showed, is this enhanced functional group tolerance. So let's look at an example from the actual, actual real world natural product example. We in, can install the tin actually in the first step, in the early stage of synthesis. And then we bring it through, look at these steps that we're bringing it through. Oxidation of the alcohol to an aldehyde. I can tell you that green yarn's not gonna survive that. Organo zinc's not gonna survive that, but you can do this oxidation, HWE, coupling, the carbon tin bond is still intact. And then that's, that's the stage for a very late stage CC bond. Yeah. The, the only disadvantage really with the Stille coupling is has to do with the toxicity of the, the tin reagents and tin byproducts that are, that are generated. People who really work in this area will, will, will have their own views on how toxic these, these reagents uh, are, but at least the perception is that they're, they're, they're not um, pleasant to work with. They're not safe to work with as compared to you know, boron coupling partners, especially on large scale. Transmetallation between carbon tin bond and, and palladium is, is slow. So you need to actively combat this slow transmetallation. There are strategies for do th to do this. One is to change the ligands on tin. We'll see an example of that. And the other is to use a promoter that can lower the barrier to a disfavored transmetallation by providing a new intermediate that can be generated. So with copper, for example, you can go from organotin to organo copper to organo palladium. So it provides you a low energy pathway to get on to the palladium. So let's look at an example of this ligand modification using this unusual, at first glance, what looks unusual ligand environment around tin. This is called a carbostanotrain, first developed by the lab of Ed Vides, and then more recent manifestations pursued by the lab of Mark Misko to great effect. So how would we expect the rate of this carbostanotrain in terms of transmetallation specifically, but more broadly in terms of this cross-coupling where we expect transmetallation potentially be turnover limiting compared to let's say tributyl tin methyl, faster or slower? I gave a long preamble, so you probably can predict faster. Okay. Why, Wenji? Because the hydrogen bond carries too many electron density to sigma star. Okay, so we have an especially weak, so I'm going to draw this in an exaggerated way. Wenji, I couldn't have said it better myself, Wenji, and to sigma star. Donation, weakening of the corresponding tin methyl bond, and this is then primed for facile transmetallation. And this feature can be taken advantage of um, in the context of an antiospecific couplings. Uh, and this has been really nicely developed, as I said, by the lab of Mark Visco. Maybe a, a quick point to consider is how, how one might make these carbostanotrain coupling partners. So if you had to make this bottom one, how would you, how would you do this? Maple hydride into the corresponding uh, allostanate. Ah, okay. I like that idea. Let's first, let's do this in two parts. Let's focus first on how you're, because if you want to use this chemistry in a general way, you probably want to get to some modular building block. And I'll just 
give you the hint that the modular building block in this case is the flora. The chloro, it turns out, if you reduce it, then it becomes actually nucleophilic at 10. So then you can just react it with your corresponding mesylate. There are also other things you could consider here. You could consider an enantioselective hydrostanylation from the corresponding thin hydride. It's not the only way it would be reasonable to draw on paper, but this is one. Thing. And then Alex had a great suggestion here, how we're gonna make this. We're gonna go back to the tri means, And then we're gonna treat it with a metal halide, sorry, metal hydride. I think you said nickel, but I think the one that works best in this case is Schwartz reagent, zinc, sorry, zirconium hydride, and then transmetallation to get to this product. Really simple chemistry. It, these reagents look complicated, but it all goes back to simple chemistry, simple concepts that we've already covered in class. So the key to this enantio specific coupling from the BISCO lab is. Uh, there are several keys to it. So the, the use of this carbostanotrain, use of copper as a promoter, use of KF as a promoter, and use of the special ligand Jackifos, whose structure is known shown here. And that brings us to our chemist of the day. Sorry, I just want to make sure I have the spelling of our last name correct. Jacqueline Hicks, a principal scientist at Merck. who developed this ligand during her postdoc, as you can imagine, with Steve Buckwald at MIT, previously a PhD, before that a PhD student with Bill Rausch, um, first at Michigan and then at sister campus in Jupiter, Florida. The key feature of Jackie Foss is that it bears the classical biural phosphine backbone of the other bulk ball ligands that has these electron withdrawing aryl groups. It was actually developed for a different context for a CN, challenging CN coupling with very electron poor nitrogen nucleophiles, specifically secondary amides, but has found use across a broad suite of reactions. So we talked about this role of copper in promoting, providing an intermediate new Cooper intermediate for transmutation. What other benefits might copper have as an additive in couplings? So let's imagine a scenario where we have an inactive form of our palladium catalyst. It is bis ligated. Copper is able to sneak in and pick up one of the phosphine ligands to populate the active form, monoligated form. It's not the only metal that can do this. Silver, for example, can also do this. Other soft metals you'd expect to also be effective for this. But what, with copper, you're, you're in a dirt cheap range. So it's convenient as an additive as a phosphine scavenger. 
So when you see cross couplings and you see copper as what looks like a random additive, you can actually think through specifically what beneficial role it might be. And then why potassium fluoride here? Thoughts on, thoughts on that? We'll see this in the context of our discussion of the Kiyama coupling. Just everything with tin, right? All right, Alex, Alex, uh, the nail on the head here. Fluoride is often able to form these eight, eight complex adducts. We saw before with tin, boron, with silicon that are more nucleophilic at carbon. Very good. All right, let's get to now our workhorse reaction, the Suzuki coupling or Suzuki Miyawara coupling. As a curiosity, how many people in the audience have run a Suzuki coupling reaction in their life? Not everybody, but 98% of the class, it looks like. That's, that's good. It's one of my favorite reactions to run. Sanagashira is probably my favorite organometallic reaction to run because it always gives 100%. The old beautiful reaction, but this is Suzuki Miura is right up there. So what's going on here? Let's um, look at, at this early example, the first first report from uh, TL late 1970s. Again, the theme of polyene synthesis comes up, and here's an example where uh, Suzuki and oh, this got messed up. Uh, where, um, Uh, here's this historical, um, historically important example, hydroboration, terminal selective hydroboration with uh, HB cat. Uh, the catechol here is in, in subsequent work has not been a very popular protecting group or ligand on boron uh, because these adducts are not super stable, uh, but they do transmetallate efficiently. And so that's what happens here. A key difference compared to the examples we covered before is now you have this necessity for base. Often, often but not always, oxygen or 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 fluor uh, oxy type bases or fluoride as the as the base. And why is that? It goes back to that example that we just saw. <coughs> so we're we're reacting through the corresponding. Eight complex. Let's draw this out so it's crystal clear. In this case, it is ethoxide, so we have this is an eight complex megatectic charge. And if we think back to our transmutation notes, we'll remember that there's an important interaction that often happens between the lone pair of oxygen here and palladium and facilitating that transmutation. There are many boron coupling partners to choose from. The state of play, at least about 10 years ago, and this is still fairly up to date, I think, was summarized in this ChemRev from the group of Guy Lloyd Jones. How do you, how do you know which to choose? Um, well, it depends on your, your goals to some extent. Synthetically, the most commonly used are boronic esters and boronic acids, and we'll talk about the relative transmutation rates of these coupling partners. When you're using um, 
B alkyl type couplings, then often 9-DBN is a popular choice because you're generating that coupling partner from hydroboration of the corresponding alkene. So this is a good choice for a B alkyl. And then you'll also see these masked boron coupling partners. These come in a couple of different flavors. There's the BF3K salts. These are often used these are sometimes called Molander salts or Molander Vidace salts, first studied in the lab of Ed Vidace and then developed in the context of cross couplings elegantly by Gary Molander's group. Uh, these are useful in cases where the corresponding boronic acid or the uh, ester is unstable. So think here like two pyridol boronic acid. That is not stable, it undergoes rapid proto deporylation. But the corresponding BF3K salt is quite unstable. What happens in solution is that the carbon, the, the boron flora, fluorine bonds are slowly hydrolyzed to generate a reactive form that can transmetallate in situ. So it's good when the corresponding bronic acid is unstable. It's also good when you need a attenuated transmetallation rate, a slow release sort of reagent. On the other, uh, on, on the most extreme in terms of stability are the two groups shown here, Dan and Maida. These you can really think of as boron protecting groups. These are analogous to silo protecting groups for alcohol. They really shut down the transmetallation rate. And they were developed specifically in the context of iterative Suzuki couplings, where you're going to couple and you're going to deprotect. You're going to cu couple a polyfunctional building block. You're going to deprotect these groups, typically with acid, to the bronic acids. Then you're going to cross couple with another polyfunctional building block. Et cetera, et cetera. So in general, these themselves do not uh, transmetallate directly. There are some exceptions, a small number of reports, maybe five reports, some special conditions. You can get them to transmetallate, but in general, you see these, just think boron protected group. That's not going to that's not going to react uh, until until it's uh, worked up uh, acidically. Okay, let's consider now problem of the day number two. I've drawn up that the key aspects of that problem for you. This comes from the lab of Scott Denmark. This question asks you to predict the relative rates of transmetallation of the, this set of organoboron coupling partners, boronic acid on the right, and then three boronic esters of different chelate size and different steric and electronic profiles. So take 30 seconds and think how you would expect those relative rates to go. And I, this is not uh, intrinsically obvious. So if you're, if you're tempted to throw your hands up, then, then you're probably not alone. But do your best, and then we'll. This is, I'll, I'll say as a disclaimer, it's quite complicated, and then we'll just unpack this and have a nice discussion around this uh, together. Is this at minus 30 to study the rate, or is this just a really effective? This is at minus 30 to study the rate. All right, give us some uh, some thoughts here, Jenny. What do you what do you think? Okay, we don't know about the bronic acid. Let's set that aside. That's fine. This one you like is the fastest, is that right? Okay. C is the second one. Uh, remind me which one is C. C is the neopental glycol. Okay. Why do you like that one? Uh, 
you're liking these two because they're unencumbered, sterically unencumbered around the oxygen. Is that, is that fair to say? Okay. And then you're gonna, within this series, crank the B pin. So we call these, um, the one on the right is ethylene glycols. So sometimes it's called EG. This one is some kind of called NEP or NEOP. In. And then we don't know where to put the, the chronic acid, but I'll just I'll just tell you because I have the paper in front of me, but and you can have it in front of you too if you download this. It goes right there. These experiments are extremely hard to do. And even despite the Denmark's group's very best efforts. In some cases, they still are not able to get crystal clean kinetics. Why are these hard to do? It's all the reasons you would expect and some you might not expect. Alex pointed out low temperature, in situ NMR monitoring, that's no picnic uh, or whatever analytical technique you wanna use, that's it's no picnic. You've got solubility issues that you can imagine all of these having slightly different solubilities and thus you don't know the active concentration. Uh, and so what's a, what's a potential explanation? I think Jenny nicely mentioned that sterics is gonna play an important role. So the less encumbered ligands on boron are gonna transmetally faster, which I think is, that's spot on. What other factors are at play? Another factor is how likely the boron can form this um, key adduct with how likely the boron is to um, uh, rehybridize, which is dependent on both the chelate size and the, the level of donation of the, um, of the oxygen ligands. And then the corresponding, how much delta minus character you build up, again, as a function of these. It's complicated. I think if you try to think through these factors, you'll, um, uh, you'll, you'll hopefully come to the conclusion that this is perhaps in line with what one would expect. And I'll just direct you to this Jack's paper for a working hypothesis for rationalized relative rates. And I call it a working hypothesis because again, this is, this is state-of-the-art chemistry that is still in the process of, of being defined. Okay, we are getting low on time, which is, is fine. Uh, but let me, let me just cover the last bits of this, these CC bond forming notes, and then we'll be well set up for Sharon's lecture on Tuesday. So now shifting from boron to silicon, we have the Hyama Denmark coupling. Um, I think in terms of the strict nomenclature here, the preferred nomenclature, you would call it a Hyama coupling if it uses fluoride, and you would call it a Hyama Denmark coupling if it doesn't use fluoride under these fluoride free type conditions that, that the Denmark group has, has uh, developed. Compared to the other couplings we've covered, it's somewhat underutilized. And that's in part because at the time that it was discovered, the Suzuki coupling was already so entrenched and well established that there wasn't a strong motivator to look into organosilicons. If in an opposite world where this had been discovered first, then they would probably have built the lig, the, you know, developed the ligands and, and and, and develop all of these libraries of silanolate reagents and we'd be using th these types of couplings today. But at the time that it discovered it was, um, there was already really good sort of infrastructure in the community built to do Suzuki couplings. Even though it is a very robust um, and underutilized reaction. In most cases, fluoride is required, including in this initial example from the Hiyama group. Why is that? Again, same theme as before. That's because we're going to make the eight complex and that will be the active form that is 
transmetallated. Sometimes even the formation of this eight complex with this, this fluoride interaction will trigger hydrolysis of some of the um, alkyl or aryl substituents on silicon to get to a more active form, depending on the, on the reaction conditions, if there's sufficient water around. So through in-depth mechanistic work from, from Denmark, uh, he was, their group was able to develop a fluoride-free protocol. And the key insight in, in that case is that they will use these silanolate salts where the oxyanion is already pre-installed. So these reactions are really hot to trot for this challenging transmetallation. And let's zoom in now on that key transmetallation step. What do we see? We see this exact type of silicon, oxygen, palladium interaction that we see in the transmetallation step for aryl or for organoboron. Remember the so-called missing link that we discussed in the transmetallation lecture. Same theme, different element. But now you can see how mechanistic work in the Hyama Denmark was direct, directly translatable to the Suzuki coupling. Another powerful CC bond forming reaction is the Sanagashira coupling. I said this is, is one of my personal favorites. I think we've run this in the lab a few times in the past couple days even. And the uh, unique part about the Sanagashira coupling is that it is dual catalytic. You'll see almost always copper as an additive. If you don't have copper as an additive, it's actually a different name reaction. It's called a heck alkylation. So there are ways to get the same connectivity without copper. Mechanistic details are a little bit different, but most often, more often than not, you're going to be using copper. And, and why is that? Let's look at the catalytic cycle. Same standard elementary steps, oxidative addition, transmetallation, elimination. But what we're transmetallating is a copper acetylide that is generated by a association of copper one to the pi cloud of the alkyne followed by a soft deprotonation to generate the corresponding copper acetylide. And then upon transmetallation, it regenerates copper. A very early example, early and important example of dual, uh, dual metal catalysis. And then the last, yeah, this will be the last chemistry I'll cover very briefly. Related CC bond forming technology discovered nearly simultaneously by the labs of Buckwald and Hartwig. And that's a common theme in, in the past two decades or so, three decades, uh, is alpha aerylation. Here, the transmetallating partner is a metal enolate that can be generated in situ from the corresponding carbonyl compound and a sufficiently strong base. So think here, sodium enolate, lithium enolate, potassium enolate, et cetera. And you can also alternatively use preformed um, uh, uh, silicon um, uh, silenol ethers or, or the like. So what happens here? We generate a, a sodium enolate. Now that sodium enolate in situ is going to be captured by the oxidative addition adduct transmetallation and then CC reductive elimination. And this is especially powerful technology for forming alpha aryl um, quaternary centers, uh, carbonyl quaternary centers as shown here, and can even be done enantioselectively in this case using binary. Same theme, different types of products. And in this case, we're forming SP3, SP2. Okay, we'll leave things there. Thanks for bearing with me for a few uh, extra minutes. I'll stay after if there are any questions. Uh, if not, have a great weekend.